begins in a galaxy far, far away, <laughs> a long forgotten times. About one billion years ago, in a galaxy one billion light years away, two black holes circled around each other. They got closer and closer, faster and faster, and their speed reached 60% of the speed of light. They finally crashed into each other. This crash steered up the structure of space-time itself. It generated gravitational waves, which in September 2015 passed through Earth and changed the distance between mirrors separated by four kilometers in remote sites in Louisiana and Washington State by an unimaginably small amount. A millionth of a millionth of a millionth of a meter. And these changes only lasted for a fraction of a second. The celebrated scientific breakthrough was not only the first direct detection of gravitational waves, or the first detection of merging black holes, or the first detection of stellar mass black holes outside our own galaxy, or the most powerful individual event ever recorded. The detection was also, also a triumph of modern technology. And what is possible if a significant number of highly talented people, and me, put their heads together to make the impossible possible? But what is this all about, and why is it so important? When you think of a star, you think of its brightness. So largely, you want to look at it. But there are billions of stars in each galaxy. At very far distances, all of them look like a single merged spot. Now try to find a black hole of the size of Paris or New York, a black hole that doesn't let any light out inside this spot. It is impossible. But, and this is our advantage, black holes make a lot of noise when they crash into one another. In the fall of 2015, we started listening with our new instruments, called LIGO, detected a few of these crashes. This whooping sound, from this sound, we determined that this was a pair of black holes, each of them around 30 times heavier than our sun, still only as large as Paris or New York. And this pair collided, merged, and we witness the formation of a new, heavier black hole, born a billion years ago. We would never have seen them. These are black holes, hiding very likely within billions of bright stars. So now we know that these black holes exist, that they existed a billion years ago, that they merge, because we listened, because we detect the gravitational waves emitted during this collision. But what are gravitational waves? Let's start with astrophysicist John Wheeler and his way to summarize uh, general relativity. He said, space-time tells matter how to move, matter tells space-time how to curve. Gravity needs to be understood as geometry in curved space-time and not as a force that exists in absolute space and time. A big words, right? Okay, they alone don't really help us here, I think. So let's try if we can visualize this in our three-dimensional world. Imagine a bowling ball, across a, and you roll it across a spandex sheet. The spandex is a two-dimensional representation of our three-dimensional world. The bowling ball will curve the spandex into its third dimension, creates a curved space. This is somewhat similar to masses which curve space-time and deform the geometry we live in. Now we can add a second bowling ball to it. The two can circle around each other like two massive stars or black holes can circle around each other. Similar to the bowling balls creating waves on the spandex, the two stars and black holes create waves in space-time. And these are the famous gravitational waves we just discovered 18 months ago. But these waves are nothing you can see. They're much more like sound waves traveling across space-time or spandex sheet stretching and compressing it. 
but the changes are incredibly small. Imagine you take a meter stick. You chop it up into a million pieces. Now you take one of these pieces, one micrometer thick, 100 times thinner than your hair. You take one of these pieces that you can barely see and chop it up another million times. Now we are 10 to the minus 12 meters, or a picometer. 100 times smaller than the smallest atom, the hydrogen atom. You still with me? Really? Because we take this piece and chop it up another million times. Now we are 1,000 times smaller than the proton. And these are the length changes that we can detect with LIGO. And here's how it works in principle. We take a laser beam, we split it up. First, we draw it again as some simple lines. We split it up, send it out into two orthogonal directions. Four kilometers away, there are mirrors, reflect the laser beam back. And we combine the laser field again. And we set it up correctly, then the maximum of one wave and the minimum of the other wave will sit on top of each other, and the laser beams will cancel each other out and will be dark at the dark port. There's no light coming out. Now, in a gravitational wave, changes the length of each of these arms. They are not longer in sync. They are kind of getting out of phase, and some light starts to show up at the dark port. This technique is called laser interferometry. It's the most sensitive way to measure any length changes. OK, this was elegant, right? I'll show you a little movie, some wiggly lines, some brighter and dimmer spots coming up there. And now everybody can run out here and build an instrument that can measure millions of a millions of a millions of a meter. Really? No. In principle, it is that simple. But the technologies that we had to develop worldwide, and which we developed in part also here at UF, they used to build the most sensitive, complex, and complicated instrument humans ever built. The details and science behind these instruments is overwhelming on its own, and it is impossible to cover this in any presentation. So let's not try to explain these things here. But what I want to say is that it took guts for our scientific fathers to start on a journey, now more than 50 years ago, to detect these gravitational waves, to prove Einstein wrong, who thought that they will never be detected, because they are so small. Let us summarize. For the last centuries, we studied the universe with our eyes and then with our telescopes. And we figured out that the visible light is only a small fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum, and we observe the universe in all electromagnetic colors and, and frequencies, ranging from, from microwaves to gamma rays. We look at the universe, but we never listen to it. And the closer we look, the more obvious it became that there are things out there that are hidden from sight, like black holes. So closing our eyes and starting to listen is the natural thing to do, except that the sound is so feeble, we first had to build detectors to naturally unimaginable sensitivity, LIGO. But LIGO is barely the beginning of our adventure into the sound of the universe. We continue to improve the LIGO detectors. We started planning new ones, but we also plan to send a detector in space. This space detector, called LISA, will use three spacecraft separated by two and a half million kilometers. Then we play Star Wars and shoot laser beams between the satellites. And use again laser interferometry to measure length changes as gigantic as 10,000 proton diameters, which, by the way, is still 10 million times smaller than a human hair. But this would be enough to detect gravitational waves from the biggest crashes in the universe, the crashes between supermassive black holes of a million to 100 million solar masses which sit inside the center of nearly every galaxy in the universe. So LISA and LIGO are after the history and evolution of black holes, the heaviest and darkest objects in our universe. Their evolution is closely linked to the evolution of our galaxies and to structure formation in the universe itself. But LIGO, and especially LISA, will also see many other signals. But this should be a topic of another talk. 
This new sense that we just opened up will open a new era in astronomy and astrophysics, which will revolutionize again our understanding of the universe. Thanks.